Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is part one of a three-part video, and this is numbered 807, so there'll be an 808 and an 809. This video is all about setting the change gears on a Model C South Bend 9-inch lathe. The next video will be setting the gears on a Model B, and then finally, in the third video, all about the quick change gearbox and the gears on a Model A. So let's begin. This is the little 9 inch lathe that was given to me by John Collings down in Florida and it is a Model C. That was the entry level model without a quick change gearbox and it has a simplified apron here without an automatic cross feed. Now, in previous videos, I've already reworked this lathe and converted it from a C to a B with a different apron. I hope you watch those other videos of mine. I'll put the links in the description. But again, this is the Model C apron, and this is the apron that is used on both the Models A and B in the 9-inch size. And in the second video in this series, I will convert it back to a Model AB with this apron. I will not show that because it's in the other videos. Now here are some pictures out of the old South Bend catalog of those three models. This is the Model C. Notice the simplified apron and there is no quick change gearbox. This is the Model B 9 inch lathe. Notice that it has the deluxe carriage which allows a power cross feed. Again, no quick change gearbox on this model. This is the middle model of the three. And this is from 1952 catalog. And here is the model A from 1952, 9 inch. Notice that it has the deluxe carriage and the very expensive and coveted quick change gearbox. Now back to the model C. Now let's take a look at the change gears here on the South Bend lathe, but the prudent and careful operator will always unplug his lathe when servicing it, and especially when working on the gear train. And I have two friends that are missing two fingers, one finger each, because they lost it in gear. So I'm going to take the cover off, but notice that on the cover there is a chart. Now this chart's very hard to read. I did touch it up a little bit, but I'm going to use the chart out of the How to Run a Lathe book, which is identical. In addition to the gears that are already installed here on the gear train, you will have received, when you bought your lathe, hopefully, a set of the change gears. Now, I'm not sure if that constitutes a complete set, but there's a dozen or more, and some of these have cluster gears on them and shafts and Try to get those if you don't already have them because you certain will, certainly will need them. Each and every gear has the number of teeth stamped on it someplace. Sometimes on the rim, sometimes on a solid gear like this. Just like that. And if you do not have them marked like that, mark them with a paint marker. And I've marked some of these others simply for instructional purposes here as I set the gears up. What is the purpose of all these gears, you say? Well, it is to transmit power from the main shaft, from this gear here, on the spindle, down through the gears, and then this is called the screw gear. That is, it's on the end of the lead screw, and we can get a ratio through these gears that will turn the lead screw and thus move the carriage at a certain rate in relationship to each revolution of the workpiece or the chuck. And why do we want to do that? Because we will be threading many different pitches or numbers of threads per inch, or we are changing the feed because the settings for the, uh, the threads are way, way too coarse to use for a longitudinal feed, as you can imagine. From this view, you can see as I turn the chuck with my hand that the gears are turning and again, this is the screw gear, and you can see the lead screw turning. 
The gear on the end of the spindle, which we will never be changing, is a 24 tooth. How do I know that? I counted them and marked it on there. So we don't need to talk about that anymore because it's a constant. These are the reversing gears here. There are two of them that are attached to the reversing lever. Let me loosen that up. Needless to say, these two gears need to be the same. They're 32 teeth and you won't be changing those either and this is the again the feed reverse lever I have loosened up this bolt and this has three positions it can be in the middle position and then lock it and when you do that the gears are not turning the lathe will run quieter and the uh, gears will have less wear on them so keep that in the neutral position like that when you're not using uh, your gears for threading or feeding. So this can be put up into one position for one direction of the lead screw and in the other position here for the other direction. So these three gears, one, two, three, are the ones that will be changed. Sometimes we're using more than three gears. You can look on the little chart if you want to see that. So at this point the 52 tooth gear here on the lead screw and the 80 here which is an idler gear if they're not doing anything but idling and changing the ratio we call them idler gears and this is the stud gear remember that name stud gear and that has to be changed and I'll show you that in a few minutes here this device here is called the banjo that that can be loosened and tilted which you'll see in a minute to give you the correct mesh between the two gears. So here's what I'm going to do in this video. First of all, since this lathe is relatively new to me, I'm going to determine what the setting is here. How many threads per inch is it? Or what is the feed rate? So I need to figure that out. And then ultimately I'm going to change the gears to get a very nice, fine, and usable feed rate for the longitudinal feed. All right, let's see how we can figure out what the correct setting is right now. And can I use it? Well, I know I can't, but that's what you need to know first. As I told you a minute ago, this is almost impossible to read, especially in the video. I could get close enough with my OptiVisor and use this, but I'd rather use a paper chart. So in the South Bend How to Run a Lathe book, there are charts. Here's, here's pictures, by the way. Study this. This is your best primer for all of you wannabe machinists. But here are two charts. This is the chart for C. Now, it's a little small to see for me, so I've blown it up. This is the chart for model B. Now, I have blown it up here so that we can talk about it. Off camera, by studying this chart I have determined that the gear train is set for 13 threads per inch. How do I know that? Because the stud gear is 32, the idler is 80, and the screw gear is 52. Now I will find that on this chart and this chart will also refer us to this particular picture. There's four little pictures here and you can see the dividing line there as it refers you to the different pictures. Let me zoom in on 13 threads per inch. Okay, look at the columns here. The first one is for threads per inch, second one for the stud gear, and then the idler gear refers to the pictures, and finally the screw gear. So, under 13 here, you can see that the stud gear is 32 teeth, and the screw gear is 52 teeth. Does that sound familiar? And it references figure 2, which I will zoom in on. Okay, I've zeroed in on figure two, and can you see that the stud gear, well, we already know what that is, and we know what the screw gear is, and the idler gear is 80 teeth. So we are set at 13 threads per inch. Somebody set that because that's a very common size, one half 13. Now I'll show you an alternate, alternate way. Was this clear as mud? Okay, here's my alternate method. Now we know that it's at 13 threads per inch, so how many thousandths is that? Well that's one thirteenth of an inch. Do the, the simple math and you'll find out that one thirteenth of an inch is 77,000. So the carriage should advance 
77 thousandths per one revolution of the spindle. So what I've done here is to set the indicator, I gotta move it up so it'll be touching the carriage here, and I will engage the leads through, that's already done, and as I revolve this, I'm gonna zoom in on the indicator because you got quite a glare, but maybe you can see that the needle is turning, or maybe you can't, and I have indicated up here on the spindle exactly one revolution. I won't show you that. Let me zoom in and take the backlash out in order to do that, or you'll get a false reading. Okay, I'm sure you can read the indicator now, and I'm right on zero, and I'm going to rotate it. You can't see me do that. Exactly one revolution. And I cannot overshoot the mark and back up because I would have backlash. So there, that's as close as I can get it. And you can see that it is, for all intents and purposes, 77 thousandths. That make any sense at all? So there are the two ways of determining <laughs> what gears are already set up on the lathe and a, a machine that you are unfamiliar with. Okay, that setting of 13 threads per inch would be just fine if we are going to thread a bolt to 13 threads per inch, such as this one half 13 bolt, but that is not a suitable feed at all to get a nice finish on work that you're turning down. So I, want, I would like to set it for about two thousandths or four thousandths of an inch of feed per revolution of the spindle. So I'm going to show you how to do that now which is really the, what this video is all about. Okay, getting back to this chart now, if you read what it says right here, it's kind of sideways, it says, I'll read it to you, you're not going to be able to see it, it says longitudinal power screw feed in inches per spindle revolution. So I'll move down to the bottom now, because the only thing that we're interested in right now is this bottom row. These are the feeds. And they're very fine ones down here. Again, three thousandths. Actually, it says 31 ten thousandths. I'm going to call it three thousandths. But it calls for a stud gear of 24 and a screw gear of 80. And it refers to figure four. And if you look at figure four here, we got some other gears we got to deal with. These idler gears here. Here's a combination gear that's 54 and 18, and another one that is 72 and 18. Now I'll lay those gears out right now. All right, I found the gears that I need. Again, there's the stud gear, that's a 24. This is the screw gear, 80, and I have two of these. I think this is the one I need. So these are cluster gears. I didn't set those up, they were already like that. And that's a 72 on the large one and an 18 on the small one, and same thing here, it's a cluster gear, it's still got the bolt in it, I hope I can use that one. It's 18 teeth for the small gear here, and 54 for the large gear. So let's go on over and install those. Okay, I'm going to remove one, two, three gears. I'll start by dropping the banjo just so the gears are disengaged. like such, and then, you know, I spent a half hour looking for a 13 16 wrench. I think I threw a lot of my 13 16 away, I never use them. Well, then I realized, how convenient is that, that the tailstock wrench fits these nuts. So, off this comes. I'll leave that on in case I need it. Set those over there. So they're out of the way and I don't confu get confused. I've already loosened that nut. And there's a bushing, a spacer. And then, of course, this gear is keyed to the shaft. It has to be positive. And then finally, the stud gear. And if these do not come off, use a shim in the gears. I don't believe it will hurt it. That's the way I do it, but it must be wood. Don't put metal in there. Again, make sure it's unplugged. 
Take your finger off and reduce it to hamburger almost instantly. All right, those gears are off. Let's put the correct ones on. If you can't stand the tediousness, fast forward. But there's the 24 tooth. Again, it's got a key. And I like to put the gear number out so I can see it at a later date or the next person can see it without being tormented. So I'll put that on and tighten it. I come from Alabama with the banjo on my knee. So you see where you get the name for this. So I'll put the 80 tooth on there, lining up the key and tighten it down a little bit. Now some of these things that I'm doing here are a bit of a struggle, so that's when I cut the camera off. You know, some people are awful concerned about casting defects, so there's a little spot that 70 years ago in the foundry a piece of sand fell loose from the mold and gave, and that's not going to hurt a thing. However, it might if this was a high-speed gear traveling at 3000 RPM, there would be a possibility of it being out of balance, so I will need this collar or bushing here also keyed and I don't know if it calls for a washer or not some things aren't very clear and beautifully finished nuts and I'll snug that up now next is this cluster gear here, the 72 slash 18 note that there's an oil hole right there and on the other side because this may be used in different configurations for different settings, but I will, this big gear is going to ride on the pinion gear here, so I will need one of these bushings that was left from the previous setting. So on that goes, and again that gear that you can't see has to be meshed with this, this gear. And I will go ahead and put a nut on there. A couple things here. First of all, this screw here is the same as this one. They got a square on the back side such that we do not need a wrench on the back side. I know you can't see the back side of the banjo, but there is a slot there that will accommodate that and keep it from turning as you tighten it up. Pretty nice little feature. And you can see at this point the gears mesh nicely. I'm going to talk more about the amount of engagement here in a little while. Okay, now this screw has to come in from this side, or bolt, whatever you want to call it, and meshes right here. So on goes the washer and the nut. I'll try to get that engaged just properly and Tighten it. We're almost done. Spin the gears over every time you add another one to make sure you don't have a tight spot or any kind of problem. Now I've loosened up the banjo cap screw and I will engage this gear with the stud gear. And back it off a little bit. I'm going to talk about that again in a minute here. I'm turning the chuck with my hand and now I will tighten the banjo. like that and we're just about ready to try it out but I want to tell you something now regarding the meshing of the gears and the amount of engagement of the teeth when gearboxes are designed and transmissions and so on the center distance from one gear to another is extremely critical it's all a mathematical formula but we do not want our gears to be engaged and bottomed out. If you do that, the gears are going to run noisy and they're going to wear real rapidly. Conversely, if you've got them too far apart, such as that, where they're barely engaged, you've got backlash and that's going to wear and damage the gears. So we want the gears to be just the right amount, which is called the working depth or engagement. Again, there's a formula for that. Well, how are you going to do that? Because we're meshing several of them here on this machine, and 
you know, we don't have accurate instruments, but some will tell you take a piece of cardstock, this is an index, and use that when you set them up, and that will space it for you. Like that. You see what I mean? But if you're not in the mood for doing that, because already you're looking at the clock and this is taking 45 minutes, your hands are dirty, and you probably are bleeding. I'm not. So, <laughs> so that's the point here, you know. And you'll just have to play around with that and practice a little bit. Let's take a look at a picture. Can you take it? This picture is from the Henry Ford Trade School book one of my perennial favorites. But looking at this picture, first of all, you'll see here that the center distance C from the center of one gear to another is very critical in a gearbox, probably not so much in what I'm showing you here, but that's what this is all about. But since we really can't measure that, we are doing it the way I just showed you. And notice here that they talk about the working depth. In this case, it's equal to 2S. Well, what is S? That's the addendum. It's in a picture below you. You don't need to know that, but you, know, you can see here that there is a little bit of a space. Can you not? All right, I've beaten that to death. Let's move on. Okay, let's see if it works. How cool is that? Don't get the tip of your can in there. All of the oil cans at the high school, I mean all, had mango tips. Need I say more? All right, there's no strange noises, there's no howling, there's no clicking or any nonsense like that. And I'm pretty darn satisfied. Always close the guard if you like your digits. Turn that off, and now let's set it up and proof it and see if we have about three thousandths feed. And do not forget to oil this gear, this gear, and these two, because you're oiling the shafts that they are riding on. And you need to do that on a regular basis when you do your other lubrication to the machine. Savvy? Okay, as you well know, on the Model C lathe, you use the half nut lever, split nut lever, for two purposes. For threading, like we had it set up for 13 threads per inch, and there was no clutch, we also use it for feeding. And it's set for a real fine feed now. You can see it's not moving very fast, but let's proof it with the indicator, like I did earlier in this lengthy video. So here's what I'm doing. Again, the indicator touching the carriage here, half nut, is engaged. I'm at my zero mark here, and I'm just going to rotate it one revolution exactly. And then we'll look at the indicator. I'll do that again, zoomed in. You know, I took the lens or the crown off of this indicator years ago, thinking it wouldn't reflect the light so much, but you still got to zoom in on it to see it. So the indicator's kind of ruined, but I got a hundred of them. I don't care. So again, one revolution. Watch that needle. What did we get? Three thousandths. Actually, it should be thirty-one ten thousandths which is beyond the capability of an indicator like this. I'd have to put a test indicator on that. Not in the mood, and neither are you, because we're just about done here. And the gearing was correct the way I did it. You can do it too. You know what? Even if you've done this many times, I think that it's going to take you 15 or 20 minutes to do that. So it is time consuming, and that's why people are reluctant to change it unless they absolutely have to by the boss's orders. Otherwise, we're going to do it some other method. But that also gives you a little idea of why they call the gearbox that we'll do, we'll see here in video three, is called the quick change gearbox. Not meant because you can shift it like a Hearst transmission, but you can do it in a matter of 30 seconds instead of 15 or 30 minutes. 
It might take you even longer if you've never done it before. Well, that concludes this long, long video. In the next part, I'm, I will have converted it back to a Model B by changing the, the apron here. I won't show that because that's in other videos. And then I'm going to show you some calculations and all of that in that video because we also have cross speed to deal with. And I want to explain that because it's not the same as longitudinal feed. However, I do not think I will change the gears in these other videos because you already have seen me do that. My hands are fairly dirty. Yours will be black if you are dealing with dirty gears. These gears were all clean when they came from Florida. So, and thank you, John. So there wasn't much of a, of a mess. But otherwise, you know, you're up to your elbows in Greece. Let me know if you like this video or if I need to do something else that would uh, interest you more because this is really a time-consuming uh, job to make this video. You, if you think the video is long on the screen, you know, triple that or four times that plus all the preparation. I'm not complaining, I'm just ex explaining. So this is Mr. Pete saying so long, see you next time and be sure and watch at least some of my 1300 languishing videos. So long. Okay, that's a pretty nice finish, three thousandths. So if you want a fine finish on your lathe, Set it down at uh, two or three thousandths, not up at ten thousandths.